It was March 12, 1862. Stonewall Jackson's army in the Shenandoah Valley had abandoned the lower valley north of Winchester and begun marching south. At dawn, the Federal forces north of the city began probing the earthworks and found them abandoned. They quickly moved in and Winchester fell to the Union without a fight. Inside, they found that many Unionist civilians had been forcibly marched south. Many of these would later die of disease in Confederate prisons. That evening, Jackson encamped between Cedar Creek and Strasburg. While this was going on, Lincoln was losing more and more confidence in General George McClellan. If you recall in the last part, McClellan had come up with an idea to launch an amphibious campaign on Urbana, Virginia, and Lincoln had decided to give him a chance at putting this into motion. Unfortunately for Lincoln, McClellan's anxieties had once again crippled the war effort. He had been dragging his feet in getting the Army of the Potomac moving to Urbana. McClellan assumed that Johnston had found out about his Urbana plan, so he decided to alter the campaign and land at Fort Monroe on the tip of the James Peninsula instead. On March 13th, McClellan and his newly appointed corps commanders informed Lincoln of his new peninsular campaign plan. Lincoln approved under the condition that McClellan ensured that Washington was left secure. A few days earlier, Lincoln had ordered War Order No. 2, which made Nathaniel Banks commander of the Army of the Potomac's V Corps. Alpheus Williams assumed command of Banks' division, now renamed the 1st Division, and James Shields commanded the 2nd Division. Within the 1st Division, the 1st Brigade was commanded by Colonel Dudley Donnelly, the 2nd Brigade by Brigadier General J.J. J. Abercrombie, and the 3rd Brigade by Colonel George H. Gordon. In the 2nd Division, the 1st Brigade was commanded by Colonel Nathan Kimball, the 2nd Brigade by Colonel Jeremiah Sullivan, and the 3rd Brigade by Colonel Erastus B. Tyler. The cavalry arm would not be under a single commander until March 28th, when Brigadier General John P. Hatch would take over. Sedgwick's division was transferred from Winchester to the 2nd Corps, now occupying Manassas. The same day that Lincoln learned of the Peninsula Campaign, March 13th, McClellan ordered Banks to leave only one division to watch the valley and move everything else, including his headquarters, to Manassas and Centerville. The next day, Jackson decided to withdraw further up the valley to Red Banks, a large homestead north of Mount Jackson. His army arrived two days later to the home on the banks of the North Fork of the Shenandoah and set up what they called Camp Buchanan. The same day that Jackson reached Red Banks, McClellan, satisfied that everything was in order in the valley, ordered Banks to leave only a single brigade of infantry at Strasburg and two cavalry regiments to operate in the valley beyond that town. Banks would set up his headquarters at Manassas and focus on rebuilding the railroad from Manassas to Strasburg. However, the following day, the 17th, McClellan amended the order and allowed Banks to keep Shields' entire division in the valley. That same day, McClellan and his army began embarking for the peninsula from Alexandria. Shields was ordered to reconnoiter south to Strasburg, and he, in turn, ordered Colonel John Mason to take two companies of the 4th Ohio Infantry and a cavalry squadron forward from Winchester. Mason drove out a few of Turner Ashby's pickets from Newton modern-day Stevens City, Virginia, and returned to Winchester having accomplished little. Williams, who was acting corps commander with Banks away, was pretty unimpressed with this anemic display and ordered Shields to conduct another reconnaissance for the following day. Shields decided to send Mason's small force, plus the 8th Ohio and 7th Indiana Infantry Regiments and two artillery sections to Cedarville then west to Middletown to catch Ashby from behind. Meanwhile, Shields would lead the 8,500 remaining men in the divisions south to take Ashby from the front. It was an ambitious plan, but David Strother, the famous illustrator and Union spy in the valley, 
had his doubts that such an enormous force could ever succeed in capturing Ashby's elusive troopers. The next day, March 18th, Mason began his reconnaissance at 4 a.m. and reached Middletown by 2 p.m., but found that Ashby had already withdrawn to Strasburg. Mason then chased Ashby to Cedar Creek, where he found the bridge destroyed. Shields arrived at Cedar Creek by evening, and the Federal forces began preparing to cross the creek the following day. By dawn, Ashby's troopers had withdrawn, and the Union entered Strasburg without opposition. Captain Robert Chu's batteries remained one mile southwest of Strasburg on Fisher's Hill and fired harmlessly at the Federals. Shields, however, believed that Jackson's entire force was nearby. He ordered Colonel Philip Dom, Chief of Artillery, to deploy on high ground west of the Turnpike opposite Fisher's Hill. Supported by three infantry brigades, and the 1st Michigan Cavalry, they were to attack Chu's batteries. However, by the time the Federals advanced on the hill, Ashby and his 700 cavalry troopers were gone. Unfortunately, Colonel Dom mistakenly opened fire on the Union advance, wounding two soldiers and killing three cavalry horses. Shields continued the pursuit for five miles. Chu's gunners challenged the Federal advance from every ridge. At 5 p.m., Shields halted and withdrew the division to Strasburg, leaving a strong forward picket. He was convinced that Jackson was camped just south of Woodstock. The next day, Shields withdrew the division back to Winchester through heavy rains. As Shields' division marched back north, 400 militia from Augusta County, Virginia, joined Jackson's army at Red Banks along with a 33-year-old man named Jedediah Hotchkiss. Hotchkiss had volunteered his services as a surveyor for the Confederacy in 1861. He would prove indispensable for Jackson in the coming months. Jackson ordered Hotchkiss to scout north toward Woodstock. Shields' sudden withdrawal from Strasburg was worrying Jackson. General Joseph Johnston had ordered Jackson to keep as much federal attention on the valley as possible to prevent McClellan from being reinforced. Now that Shields was falling back, there was a danger that his division would leave the valley to join the enormous army that would be marching on Richmond. This was unacceptable. Jackson began preparing an offensive of his own. The day after Shields withdrew from Strasburg, March 21st, General Banks, content that Jackson was at Mount Jackson, reassured McClellan that everything was in order and planned to send William's division to Centerville the following day. Shields encamped two miles north of Winchester, leaving only a small guard on the southern edge of town and a squadron of the 1st Michigan Cavalry watching the Valley Pike to Kernstown. The next day, Jackson began marching north to Winchester. By that evening, the army would be in Strasburg. As they marched, Ashby's troopers ran into pickets of the 1st Michigan Cavalry outside Kernstown. Ashby's 290 troopers forced the Union Cavalry across Abrams Creek and deployed Chu's battery on a ridge west of Hillman's Tollgate and began bombarding Union positions on the outskirts of Winchester. Major Joseph Matthews deployed his 46th Pennsylvania Infantry Companies and pushed Ashby skirmishers back across Abrams Creek. Shields was slow to respond to this threat. After confirming that enemy artillery was south of Winchester, he deployed two batteries, Battery H, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, under Captain James Huntington, and Battery L, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, under Captain Lucius Robinson toward the enemy. The 67th and 8th Ohio Infantry Regiments also arrived. Just then, one of Chu's shells knocked Shields down, wounding him. Unable to remain on the field, Shields was carried off to Winchester, and Colonel Kimball took over command on the field. More Union regiments from Kimball's brigade arrived, and deployed into line on the right of the pike, with the 67th and 8th Ohio regiments to the left. 
Sullivan's brigade formed in reserve. Kimball ordered an advance by sundown, and Ashby, outnumbered, withdrew to Newton. Banks and Shields were both still convinced that Jackson was far south on the defensive. Williams' division had already departed for Manassas. With Ashby having withdrawn, the Federals only deployed a couple cavalry squadrons forward to picket the Front Royal and Romney roads. There were no serious preparations for any incoming attack. Kimball's brigade encamped at Kernstown, Sullivan's brigade at Milltown, where the Valley Pike crossed Abrams Creek, and Tyler's brigade north of Winchester. Ashby, on the other hand, reported to Jackson that only four Union regiments and two batteries remained in Winchester, and these were preparing to flee to Harper's Ferry. Ashby requested a few infantry companies to retake Winchester. Jackson accepted Ashby's report and was determined to attack immediately in order to draw Banks back into the valley. At dawn the following day, Tyler's brigade prepared to move to Centerville. Kimball, however, was alert. He ordered Lieutenant Colonel Franklin Sawyer to reconnoiter west of the Valley Pike with three companies of the 8th Ohio Infantry. Sawyer moved to Opequan Church without incident, but suddenly spotted horse artillery deploying 400 yards to the south. These were Ashby's 7th Virginia Cavalry and Chew's Battery. Supporting these troops were four companies of Confederate infantry under Captain John Quincy Adams Nadenbausch of the 2nd Virginia Infantry. At 9 a.m., Chew fired the first shots of the Battle of Kernstown. Kimball immediately recalled Colonel Samuel Carroll from Winchester and ordered him and the rest of the 8th Ohio Infantry east of the pike while Sawyer took position on the west. Kimball spotted Pritchard Hill and instantly recognized it as the key position of the battlefield. He ordered Battery A, 1st West Virginia Artillery, Battery E, 4th U.S. Artillery, and Battery B, 1st West Virginia Artillery up the hill. He also ordered the 67th Ohio Infantry to clear Ashby's forces from the western base of the hill. The regiment accomplished this and returned to the hill to support Battery A. Meanwhile, Kimball ordered the 5th Ohio Infantry of Sullivan's Brigade behind Battery B. Facing this, Ashby was forced back across Hogue's Run. Kimball's artillery counterfired Chu's artillery. Ashby ordered the 2nd Virginia to file right of the pike, formed two companies of skirmishers with two more companies in reserve, and probed to the north. He also sent two of Chu's guns to support this advance. Carroll's seven companies of the 8th Ohio, plus three companies of the 67th Ohio, were assembled in woods with his pickets behind a stone wall 300 yards north of Hogue's Run. Nathan Bausch advanced and ordered a volley at 100 yards followed by a charge. This sent the Federal pickets back to the woods with the Confederates in pursuit. Carroll's main line then fired a counter volley and the 2nd Virginia ran for cover. An intense firefight began between these units. From Pritchard Hill, Kimball ordered the 14th Indiana Infantry forward from Milltown to support Carroll. By 11 a.m., the 2nd Virginia and Ashby had been pushed back half a mile southeast of Kernstown. The battlefield now quieted down, with the 14th Indiana and the 5th and 8th Ohio positioned 700 yards north of Ashby's position. At this point, both the Union and the Confederate forces each underestimated each other's strength. Ashby was still convinced that only a small Union force stood between him and Winchester, and Union reconnaissance efforts had not detected Jackson's army approaching. Having halted Ashby's advance and thrown it back, there was, in Kimball's mind, no immediate cause for concern. Hearing these early reports, Banks left for Washington. While Jackson approached, Sullivan advanced his brigade at Kimball's request to the stone wall 
that Carroll had been at before pursuing the 2nd Virginia. The 39th Illinois was on the left, the 62nd Ohio in the center, and the 13th Indiana on the right. Shields remained in Winchester far from the field and gave no clear commanding orders. Kimball sent the 84th Pennsylvania with 503 officers and men to the eastern slope of Sandy Ridge near the intersection of Pritchard's Lane and Middle Road. Kimball declined to advance further on Ashby, fearing other Confederate forces in the area. At noon, the leading elements of Jackson's column, the Stonewall Brigade, reached Opequan Creek two miles south of Kernstown. Jackson moved his column off the pike to the northwest into woods. Jackson had 3,087 infantry with him due to straggling on the long march. Accompanying these men were 29 artillery guns and Ashby's cavalry already on the field. Jackson initially intended to wait until the next day to attack, but saw the guns on Pritchard Hill and thought that they could see his force and would be calling for reinforcements if he delayed. Unfortunately, Jackson did not see the infantry support on the hill and did not confer with Ashby before making his move. Jackson decided to outflank the Federals by taking Sandy Ridge. Colonel Samuel Fulkerson's brigade reached the northern end of Barton's Woods, 400 yards southwest of Opaquan Church at 2 p.m. The Stonewall Brigade, minus the 5th Virginia posted near the pike, followed Fulkerson. Jackson detached the artillery north of the Opaquan under his personal command. He ordered Colonel Jesse Burks's brigade to support the artillery and leave the 42nd Virginia in the rear. As usual, none of Jackson's subordinate commanders knew anything about his battle plans. Kimball noticed Fulkerson's troops from Pritchard Hill and opened fire with artillery. Jackson hurriedly ordered Fulkerson to turn the Union flank on the hill. Federal artillery fired on Fulkerson's men as they advanced over open ground. Battery L, 1st Ohio Light Artillery, under Captain Lucius Robinson, deployed at the intersection of Middle Road and Pritchard's Lane and began firing at the leading 37th Virginia. The 84th Virginia advanced 400 yards southeast of Battery L. Fulkerson, under fire, moved to the left, west of Middle Road, to seek shelter in woods near the base of Sandy Ridge. There, his men endured 30 minutes of punishing bombardment. However, as this was happening, Garnett was not close behind Fulkerson. He sent the lead of his brigade, the 33rd Virginia, 200 yards behind Fulkerson, but the rest of the Stonewall Brigade did not receive word and remained in Barton's woods. The 33rd Virginia also received heavy fire and diverted to the west under Garnett's direct command to the far side of Sandy Ridge. Garnett, lost and unaware of the enemy's strength, decided to return to Barton's woods to link up with the rest of the Stonewall Brigade. Meanwhile, Jackson had taken command of the rest of the Stonewall Brigade and ordered his staff officer, Sandy Pendleton, to relay the regiments to Sandy Ridge. Pendleton found the 2nd and 4th Virginia and delivered the order to their commanders, sending the regiments on their way. Similarly, these units came under artillery fire as they crossed over open ground. At the same time, Jackson ordered Ashby to make a feint on the Union left. Ashby and 150 of his men galloped across Hogue's Run taking some prisoners before being repelled with one man killed and six wounded. In response to this action, Kimball sent the 14th Indiana to support Carroll and kept three regiments of Sullivan's Brigade east of the pike. Back at Barton's Woods, Captain William McLaughlin's Rockbridge Artillery crossed to Sandy Ridge next, followed by the 21st and 27th Virginia and Captain James Waters' West Augusta Battery. After this, Jackson ordered a section of Captain Joseph Carpenter's battery to counterfire Pritchard Hill from Barton's Woods. 
Carpenter's fire scattered the three Union regiments supporting the guns behind the hill. Confederate forces at Sandy Ridge were scattered and disorganized. In his book, Peter Cozens describes it as such, quote, Fulkerson's brigade lingered in the woods 600 yards west of Pritchard's Hill. Barnett and the 33rd Virginia clung to the western slope of Sandy Ridge 600 yards south of Fulkerson, unaware that the 2nd and 4th Virginia had come to rest behind a low rise the same distance south of them. Neither Fulkerson nor Garnett were yet aware of the arrival of the 21st or 27th Virginia regiments. Neither did Garnett know that Jackson had sent McLaughlin's and Waters' batteries, both of which belonged to his brigade, to Sandy Ridge, end quote. Jackson and Fulkerson encountered each other in the confusion at Fulkerson's position. Garnett insisted that they withdraw to Barton's woods, and Fulkerson reluctantly agreed. Meanwhile, McLaughlin and Waters' batteries deployed on the eastern slope of the ridge, and two guns of Carpenter's battery deployed just northeast of them. McLaughlin's battery began firing. Pendleton returned from a reconnoiter further up the ridge where he spotted 10,000 federal troops between Pritchard Hill and Winchester. He told Jackson that he counted five Union regiments marching down Cedar Creek Grade Road to Sandy Ridge. Jackson replied, Say nothing about it. We are in for it. Jackson ordered the 27th Virginia forward to support Carpenter's exposed guns and prevent them from being captured from the impending Union attack. They advanced 800 yards up the ridge past Carpenter's guns to a high stone wall running east to west 500 yards along the spur of the ridge. Colonel John Eccles, commanding the 27th Virginia, sent his second in command to find Garnett and inform him of Jackson's orders. Up to this point, Kimball had been focused on his left and on Ashby, not on the ridge. When Confederate guns began shelling Pritchard Hill, Kimball ordered Tyler's brigade to clear Sandy Ridge. The 7th Indiana was at the hill, and the 7th Ohio was supporting Battery L, 1st Ohio Light Artillery. Tyler reunited his brigade, massed them in depth with the 7th Ohio in the lead, followed by the 7th Indiana, 1st West Virginia, 110th Pennsylvania, and the 29th Ohio. Tyler followed the Cedar Creek grade road for a bit, then turned left onto the ridge, staying in depth formation. It was this force that Pendleton spotted heading for the exposed Confederate batteries. At 3.55 p.m., the opposing skirmishers met 300 yards north of the stone wall. Eccles withdrew behind the wall and ordered a volley fire. Stunned, the Federal advance began wavering. Some companies of the 7th Ohio tried charging close to the wall until their commander ordered them to take cover. Tyler tried getting his brigade into line of battle. The 7th Indiana was forced to find cover. The 1st West Virginia also took cover in good order. However, the 110th Pennsylvania panicked in the opening moments of the firefight and fled through the 29th Ohio. The 29th stood firm, with some companies going forward to the 1st West Virginia in the gap left behind. Jackson ordered the 21st Virginia up to the stone wall. This regiment took position to the right of the 27th Virginia. Tyler extended his line to the right, west of the Confederates, hoping to outflank them. The 1st West Virginia formed line of battle and advanced on an unoccupied stretch of stone wall west of the 27th Virginia. However, an unexpected line of rebels appeared and fired a volley, scattering the 1st West Virginia back from the wall and wounding their commander. These rebels were the 23rd and 37th Virginia of Fulkerson's Brigade. As soon as the firing started, Garnett, who had been with the second in command of the 27th Virginia that Eccles had sent to find him, 
told the 33rd Virginia, then 300 yards south of the wall, to move to the right of the 21st Virginia. Then Garnett led the 4th Virginia to a gap between Fulkerson's right and the left of the 27th Virginia at the wall. The two leftmost companies of the 4th Virginia deployed in a ravine and became isolated from the rest who were on higher ground. The 4th Virginia helped to shatter what was left of the 7th Indiana and 7th Ohio, driving them back to the rear to find cover. Union soldiers responded as best they could from behind cover. Sergeant Thomas Marsh of the 29th Ohio wrote later, In the excitement of battle, I could aim at the rebels when only 40 or 50 yards from me as coolly as I ever did at a squirrel. But now it seems very much like murder. They would throw up their hands and fall almost every time we would get a fair shot at them, and we would laugh at their emotions and make jest of their misfortune. Virgil Smalley of the 7th Ohio wrote, Shortly after the steady work of fighting began, a big burly farmer boy, who was a sergeant in my company, stood on the knoll which served me as a shelter and kept shouting and waving his hands like an insane man. He was suddenly crazed for the moment with the excitement of the battle. He now ran along the ridge, screaming and gesticulating, until I lost sight of him in the smoke. It is singular how differently men are affected by a battle. Some are frantic, some flushed and exhilarated, some pallid and nervous but calm and plucky, some tremble with fear. Jackson next ordered the 2nd Virginia to the right of the 33rd Virginia. The 1st Virginia Battalion also entered the battle, filling a gap between the 27th and 21st Virginia. Jackson suddenly realized that Kimball actually outnumbered him and decided to try to hold his ground until nightfall. Kimball now ordered Sawyer and his section of the 8th Ohio who had been supporting Robinson's Battery L at the intersection of Middle Road and Pritchard's Lane, into battle. Sawyer ordered a charge with fixed bayonets across an open meadow up the slope of Sandy Ridge and collided with two companies of the 1st Virginia Irish Battalion who were beyond the stone wall. After some very close quarters fighting, the 8th Ohio halted its advance. A few minutes after this, the 84th Pennsylvania 5th Ohio and 67th Ohio regiments arrived from Pritchard's Hill on Sawyer's left. The 67th Ohio, an untrained regiment, attacked the 2nd Virginia at the junction of the stone wall with a rail fence and suffered badly. The 5th Ohio entered the action on the left of the 67th Ohio. Unfortunately, Kimball, not wanting to leave the artillery on Pritchard Hill, without infantry support, sounded recall by bugle once the 5th Ohio and 84th Pennsylvania were marching into battle at the double quick. Half of the 5th Ohio Regiment heard the recall while the other half entered combat. The 84th Pennsylvania, meanwhile, straggled in the woods of Sandy Ridge, leaving the left flank of the 5th Ohio exposed. In front of the 5th Ohio, was the remnants of the 1st Virginia Irish Battalion that had collided with Sawyer's section of the 8th Ohio. Further ahead was the West Augusta Battery, and on the extreme right was the 2nd Virginia. The 5th Ohio was hit by a heavy volley and began ferocious close quarters fighting. The 84th Pennsylvania tried but failed to link up with the 5th Ohio. At the time of the battle, the Pennsylvania Regiment was dealing with a mutiny against its commander and was missing many junior grade officers. The regiment proceeded forward in confusion and was subject to devastating canister fire from the West Augusta Battery and the Irish Battalion. The 2nd Virginia opened up on the 5th Ohio and the right flank of the 84th Pennsylvania. The 21st Virginia redeployed to another stone wall 500 yards southeast and attacked the left of the 84th Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvanian's commander was killed in the furious barrage trying to extricate his men 
and the rest of the regiment shattered. Colonel John Patton of the 21st Virginia and not Jackson had been responsible for the successful maneuvers that halted the offensive from Pritchard Hill. Next, Kimball sent the 14th Indiana forward. Unfortunately, its commander was drunk and the regiment marched forward and mistakenly fired a volley into the rear of the 5th Ohio. The Indianans were directed to the left of the 5th Ohio and went into position at the same time that the 84th Pennsylvania was disintegrating. The Indianans suffered similarly brutal fire but managed to hold their ground. Some of their men managed to push the Irish battalion back behind the stone wall while others charged the 21st Virginia. As this was going on, Garnett had been calmly moving up and down the ranks, surveying the situation. The Stonewall Brigade was running out of ammo and enduring serious casualties. Finally, at 6 p.m., Garnett ordered the 21st Virginia to withdraw. The remnants of the Irish Battalion withdrew as well, and the West Augusta Battery limbered up and moved out as well, losing one cannon in the process. The 14th Indiana began pursuing them. The 29th Ohio relieved the depleted 7th Ohio and 7th Indiana. A detachment of the 1st Ohio Cavalry began rounding behind the stone wall near the glass farm and taking Confederate prisoners. Garnett, afraid that his position was about to be enveloped and with no word on Jackson's whereabouts, ordered a withdrawal from the stone wall. The 27th Virginia was out of ammo, and the 33rd Virginia was losing cohesion. The commanders of both these regiments were grateful that Garnett ordered a withdrawal. The isolated companies of the 4th Virginia in the gully fought on, unaware that the withdrawal order had been given. It was now getting dark. Tyler's brigade did not immediately realize that the stone wall was being evacuated. Most of his troops were, by now, too exhausted to pursue en masse, but some soldiers did manage to fire on the retreating Confederates. Even so, the withdrawal was generally uncoordinated and chaotic. In the confusion, many Confederate soldiers were captured by the Union cavalry. The 2nd Virginia did not get the withdrawal order and the regiment was surrounded with between 40 to 50 men captured. Meanwhile, Jackson was probably by the Rockbridge artillery far from the wall. Jackson only realized something was wrong after 6 p.m. when retreating troops of the 21st Virginia ran by the battery. It was here that the famous incident happened where Jackson stopped a fleeing soldier to demand to know where he was headed. When the soldier explained that he had exhausted all of his ammunition and was headed for the rear, Jackson curtly replied, then go back and give them the bayonet. Amid this chaos, Jackson brought up the 5th Virginia, which had been in reserve by the Valley Pike. However, much of the regiment fell out in the sprint to get into action. Jackson ordered the few that managed to arrive into the woods south of Garnett. However, this did little to rally the 21st Virginia and others. The commander of the 5th Virginia encountered Garnett and was told that all he could do was cover the retreat. Garnett placed the 5th Virginia behind another stone wall a quarter mile south of the original stone wall, facing an open field. Jackson spotted the 5th Virginia arranging itself behind the wall for an ambush and assumed that Garnett had ordered the regiment to retreat. Jackson encountered Garnett and expressed his displeasure that he had chosen to withdraw, claiming that if Garnett had waited five more minutes, he would have received reinforcements from the 42nd and 48th Virginia. Cozens explains why Jackson's claim here was dubious or a flat-out lie. Quote, The 42nd Virginia, then double-quicking across Pritchard's fields under a heavy fire of artillery from the knob, was at least 15 minutes away at the time Jackson and Garnett met. Moreover, the 48th Virginia, which was guarding the army trains three miles in the rear, 
was at least an hour from the battlefield, as Jackson well knew, having sent Sandy Pendleton just a short time before to retrieve it, end quote. Jackson ordered the 5th Virginia forward from the wall across the open field. To their right and front at this moment were the 14th Indiana and portions of the 5th Ohio and 67th Ohio. To their left was the 110th Pennsylvania, which had rallied after the stone wall had finally been cleared of rebels. Jackson ordered Pope's section of the Rockbridge artillery forward behind the stone fence. 5th Virginia were only able to endure a few volleys before they broke and fled to the rear, leaving Pogue's section all alone. Pogue lost one of his two guns here, while McLaughlin managed to extricate the remainder of the Rockbridge artillery. The 5th Virginia rallied behind the stone wall that Garnett had originally placed them in. The 42nd Virginia arrived around this time and took position to the right of the 5th Virginia. Part of the 14th Indiana became preoccupied with Pogue's dropped cannon, while the remainder endured fire from the 42nd Virginia. Just then, the 13th Indiana, which had been far on the Union left east of Pritchard Hill, arrived on the left of the 14th Indiana. It smashed the right flank of the 42nd Virginia at around 7 p.m. and broke the rebel line, sending it fleeing. By now it was too dark to mount a full pursuit. Even so, the Union managed to capture approximately 200 prisoners. The 1st West Virginia Cavalry and 1st Michigan Cavalry joined in the pursuit, though not very aggressively or effectively. Rebel soldiers tried to make it to the Valley Pike in the darkness. Confederate Cavalry were ineffective in stemming the Union Cavalry's pursuit. Jackson ordered the army to encamp on the pike south of Newton, but soldiers scattered everywhere, building makeshift campfires out of fence rails wherever they could. Many rebels believed that the battle had been a total loss, with the army barely escaping complete destruction. Meanwhile, Kimball declined to pursue Jackson that night, noting that his soldiers were exhausted and unfed. Union soldiers scoured the battlefield all night, carrying wounded men back to their camp. Cozens illustrates several accounts of Union soldiers that night. I'll share one that I found particularly amusing. Ordnance Sergeant A.J. Jackson had curled up beside a sack of straw, surrounded by wounded men. After he lay down, hospital orderlies arrived to carry the wounded to a field hospital, carting off a sleeping Jackson among them. Not until a surgeon, making his rounds, shook him sharply by the shoulder, did Jackson awake. This man is dead. Try the next, he heard someone say, the next man being Jackson. Jumping to his feet, Jackson hurried away. Hey, what's the matter with you? Come back here, called the surgeon. Not much, answered Jackson. You can't patch me up. I'm all right. The next day, Union forces continued to tend to the wounded alongside the civilians of Winchester. Confederate prisoners were marched north to the Winchester and Potomac Depot to be transported away. Altogether, of Jackson's force of 3,500 men present for the battle, 139 were killed or mortally wounded, 312 were wounded, 253 were captured, and 33 were missing. Casualties for the Confederates totaled 737, or 22.4% of the force engaged. On the Union side, 6,352 men had been present for battle. 118 were killed or mortally wounded, 450 were wounded, and 22 were missing. Casualties for the North totaled 574, or 8.2% of the force engaged. Although statistically the battle was a clear loss for Jackson, it seriously disturbed northern commanders. Some captured Confederate officers told Union interrogators that Jackson was about to receive 30,000 reinforcements. General Banks returned to Winchester from Harper's Ferry, and General McClellan, about to embark for the James Peninsula, ordered Banks to attack Jackson beyond Strasburg with infantry and beyond Mount Jackson with cavalry if possible. 
The hunt for Jackson was on.